everybody. So I wanted to show you guys another video that will probably help you with your upcoming homework and doing the, some of the stuff in Excel that the book is actually showing you in a program times called Minitab. Um, Minitab is kind of cool, but nobody would ever use it, especially to the extent that people use Excel. So I would love to show you guys this stuff in Excel. So this is going to be related to sections 14.8 and 14.9 right here. So let's actually look at 14.9 first because the first formula we're going to use is something that's called the leverage of an observation right here. And that leverage is going to show up some in some other formulas that are actually earlier in chapter 14. So I'm going to go back and show you like we're using this leverage already for section 14.8. But let's start by just running a regression with that same data we had before. So I've actually done this in the same spreadsheet I did in the last video for that butterfly diagram right here. So let's go ahead and do data analysis, regression. Our Y is going to be revenue, so the revenue earned by utilities that sell electricity. And then that's going to probably depend on electricity consumption. So I'll highlight that data. Labels, because I included them. I'll put this all in the same spreadsheet again. Let's go ahead and put it right here in D2. And now notice I've checked on a bunch of these boxes that we haven't really used before. I'm actually going to uncheck standardized residuals because the way that Excel um, calculates standard residuals is a tiny bit different than the way the book has you do it. So clicking on that might actually confuse you a little bit because if the homework, for example, asks you for the standardized residual and you plug in the number that Excel produces, it will not be the right answer. So we'll go ahead and calculate those in a formula. But what we can do now is just click OK and we get our standard output up here. But notice this time we got some extra stuff. So first of all, we got some plots over here. And section 14.8, the validating the model assumptions, actually does some of these plots. This is actually a scatter plot that's very similar to what you guys did for your project draft. The only difference is that the fitted values or points instead of just being a straight line when you put on a regression line. But right here, this is just like one of the plots that's shown in section 14.8, validating the assumptions. So we like to have a really smooth kind of normal errors around our X variable. So this is X, electricity consumption and the residuals, so the sample errors. And we want those to be normal looking. What we don't like to see are really crazy points, kind of like this one up here for a couple of reasons. So this might be displaying heteroscedasticity because it seems like the errors over here have a higher variance than the errors over here. So that's one of the assumptions. This plot might tell us we're actually violating one of those assumptions. So I just wanted to show you, you can get a lot of the information that'll help you by clicking some of those extra features in the Excel data analysis tool pack. I'm gonna drop this one for now because that one's not super helpful. And this one is also not super helpful because we've seen that before. Another thing that Excel or the book shows you sometimes is doing the same plot basically, but with fitted values or Y hat on the X axis and residuals on the Y on the x-axis and residuals or sample errors on the y-axis. You can make that plot really easily too because look right here we have y hat predicted value and right here we have residuals. So we could go and click doot doot doot. Doot doot doot. You guys know how to insert a scatter plot. And look, we get basically, if you look closely, you'll see that the pattern is exactly the same. And there's a good reason for that. These numbers, y hats, are just a linear function of these numbers right here. This is just this 
plus an intercept or times the slope plus the intercept. So that's why you get exactly the same pattern. The book points out that this graph down here is going to be more valuable to us in the future when we do multiple regression because in multiple regression, instead of just having one indef independent var variable and electricity consumption, we might have many independent variables. And so you would have to go through and look at a ton of these different plots and individually they wouldn't give you that much information. But we will still only get a single predicted value. So for in this case, predicted revenue. So we'll still only have one plot where we have y hat on the x and residuals on the y. So that becomes a more powerful and commonly used plot because multiple regression, which we're gonna move into in the next video, is a really more common type of analysis. But that's a good way where right when we get our regression results here, we can also think about the assumptions of the model by looking at these plots that Excel will produce for you. It also produces other valuable information. So here's all of our predicted values. Here's all of our residuals or sample errors. So that's gonna be useful. So let's go ahead and give ourselves some space here because we are going to make some calculations using those residuals. So I'm going to write leverage right here. And then I'm just going to use this formula, leverage of observation I, right there. That leverage is going to give us some indications of whether we have an influential observation. Notice the problem with an influence, influential observation is really nicely demonstrated in this figure 14.20. So look at this. this observation right here is causing the predicted line to be downward sloping. But imagine what would have happened if we didn't have this one point. Imagine that point disappearing and our line probably would be upward sloping through those. So that's influencing our results to a great degree and we might be concerned about that. So let's go ahead and use that formula leverage in our Excel spreadsheet. So hi equals one divided by n. n is number of observations right there. Let's lock that. Plus, notice so you've seen this before when we did our prediction and confidence intervals. That's like that penalty for being far away from the mean of the independent variable. So plus, open parentheses, my first observation of my independent variable is actually right up there, right? So xi minus x bar, that's the average of the x values. Oops, it looks like I highlighted the wrong thing there. So let's make sure, whoa average of the x value, so a2 down to a51. So that's all of our um, x values. So that's the average of x, x bar. That's that guy right there. So I did xi, the, and I did x1 because I'm working with the first observation right now. So x1 minus x bar, so we need to square that still. So let's add another parenthesis. Otherwise, notice we would just be squaring the average, but that guy tells us to square the deviation from average. So you have to kind of think about your parentheses in this case. Now I'm going to show you a new function in Excel that's helpful. Dev SQ. That's going to give us the sum of squared deviations from the mean. So last time we did that in multiple steps because I wanted to show you how it worked. But Excel actually gives us a formula to do this. So that devsq right there, if I highlight my x values right here, close the parentheses, that gives exactly what this says, sum of squared deviations from x from the mean. Sum of squared deviations from the mean. So the total variation in x 
the individual variation of this point squared divided by the total variation in x. In other words, the proportion of the total variation in x that it's accounted for by this one point right here. So that dev sq function does all of this right here. Devi sum of squared deviations. And that's that dev sq. So let's go ahead. I think I have all my parentheses okay. So enter. That's the leverage for that point. And I need to actually lock some more cells. So what do we want to lock here? So we want the x value to move down, right? That's that a2 right there, the red a2. And that's why it's a red box right here. And so I don't want to lock that one because I'm about to drag this formula down and I want that to follow it down. However, I do want to lock the average because otherwise that whole rectangle that I highlighted the average will move. I also want to lock the sum of squared deviations right there. And so basically everything is locked except that xi. Looking back at the formula, all of these, so x1 I should say, because I'm in particular doing x1. This is for a general xi. We want that to move. We don't want this to move, remember, because that formula is a whole rectangle that has a bunch of xi's in it, not just the particular one we're looking at in this case. So let's push enter on that. Double click it down. And then let's go see if we can find any of these big. So right here, observation number five. That observation has a lot of leverage. That is actually going to be one, two, three, four, five. Look at that. That's a big outlier in our data set. So that leverage is telling you, hey, this is a relatively influential observation compared to these others. Because notice all these others are hovering around kind of less than 0.1. That one goes above 0.1. Here's another one. You could go see that that's going to be a pretty big outlier too. Here's a huge one right here. That's that 439. So that's the 43rd observation. That is probably, so we know we have 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43rd right there. That's a big outlier right there again. So that's that one has a lot of leverage. That's probably this point right here. Is it? Maybe? Let's see. So it's actually not that one. That one's going to be an electricity consumption value of... 250 million, so that one probably should be relatively easy to find. Let's see here. Oh yeah, that's that other one we already looked at that had a pretty high leverage here. All right, so that's going to give us the leverage, which 14.9 explains. That's a good way to look for influential observations. Notice in their example right here, that as crazy leverage, and that's why it's having such a huge impact on this regression line. So now I want to show you some stuff from 14.8. The reason for that is that we're actually going to use that leverage in some of the formulas from 14.8, so it's kind of easier to do that first. So standardized residuals is one thing that we can use in order to see if we have kind of normal errors around. Because remember, the fourth assumption was normality of the residuals, or normal errors. Now, how do we standardize anything in statistics? Well, we take the estimate. Remember what the residual or the standard error is the actual value of y minus our predicted value of y. So that's our estimated error. Now, we take our estimate, and what do we divide it by? We divide it by its standard deviation or its standard error, and then we're normalizing it. It's kind of like making apples and apples comparisons because errors in certain analyses are not necessarily comparable to errors in other analyses, which will depend on things like units, size. If I'm looking at tiny little microbes and measuring them, 
maybe like viruses, if I'm doing something about viruses and the size of them, they're going to have tiny errors just because of measurement. Versus if I'm looking at electricity consumption in states, I'm going to get some huge numbers. So I would never be able to compare residuals in those two cases unless I did st some type of standardization. And that's why we use standardized residuals. So notice this, the first thing we need to do standardization is the standard deviation of the ith residual. Right there, s, which we talked about in the last video, is the standard error of the regression. Square root, 1 minus h. We just calculated h because that is indeed the leverage. So let's go back to Excel now. And I'm going to do the standard deviation of the residual. So I'll call that SD resid. That's going to equal S, which we showed last time. Boom, right there. Lock that because we don't want th that's going to be the same for all of these. So we lock it. Multiplied by square root 1 minus leverage right here, which we just calculated. So right there I have S, the standard error of the estimate, which I've been calling the standard error of regression. They just call it the standard error in Excel right there. That is what S is. And then H, oh look, that's the leverage we just calculated already. And then so that's all we really need for this formula. S, the standard error, times square root, 1 minus H. Let's check it out. S times square root, 1 minus H, which is called leverage. Enter double click it down, and now we can get the standardized residual right here because we just said that our standardized residual will be our residual divided by, uh-oh, uh-oh, command Z, our best friend, equals our residual, careful when we click it this time, divided by its standard error or standard deviation enter, double click it down, and now we have a bunch of standardized errors. Notice that we normally take the estimate and subtract the average to get a deviation from average for our numerator when we're standard standardizing stuff. So you did that a lot in stats one, I think, when you did the z-scores. A z-score is a standardized observation. That's what a z-score is. And in a z-score, you take the deviation from the mean. But why don't we have to do that when we're looking at residuals? Well, what is the mean residual? What is the average error? Again. It's a very, very tiny number. It's not exactly zero, basically due to rounding in Excel, but that's basically zero and has to be zero because one of the assumptions that we force to be true in the sample of data is that the errors on average are zero. Because again, we talked about this the last live class. If my errors aren't zero on average, that'd be kind of a weird way to model things. All right, so I thought this would be helpful in terms of looking at some of the homework, especially the ones that do is due next Sunday. But please let me know if you have any questions about this. And um, thank you for listening. I'll talk to you guys again soon.